Welcome to Sundays at Cafe Tabac, the podcast. Hi, I'm Wanda Acosta. Hi, I'm Karen Song. This podcast series is an extension of our film's mission to affirm and extol the courage, vision, strength, and joy in our LGBTQ community through the preservation and sharing of our personal stories and the collective histories we live through and change. In the late 80s, there was an estimated 200 lesbian bars nationwide. Now, only 21. These bars, an embodiment of our rich history, have disappeared at a staggering rate. And when our history isn't protected, we must protect it ourselves. This is the idea that lives at the heart of our project and the project of our next guest. For this episode, we are pleased to introduce Alina Street, a Franco-American filmmaker based in Brooklyn, New York, and co-director of the Lesbian Bar Project. Alina, along with her co-director, Erica Rose, decided to make a film and run a fundraiser for their beloved lesbian bars and raise awareness for the alarming trend of lesbian bar closures nationwide. This trend, which was well underway for a variety of historic reasons, which our own Sundays at Cafe Tabac feature film set out to investigate in depth, was further accelerated by the pandemic lockdowns. But as a result of the pandemic, we've achieved a greater collective consciousness that yearns for the values, the sanctity of our queer nightlife spaces and the critical opportunities they provide us to physically be and celebrate together. That yearning was the impetus for Alina and Erica's project, which raised over $117,000 for lesbian bars nationwide in Jägermeister's Save the Night campaign at the height of the COVID lockdowns last year when our bars were facing existential threats. This month for 2021 Pride, they have just launched an even larger fundraising campaign to raise $200,000 in critical funds to help save our bars. Additionally, to support this effort, they've just released the Lesbian Bar Project documentary that they shot with Orange is the New Black Star and LGBTQ icon Leah Delaria as executive producer. In this intimate interview, Alina shares with us the seeds of this project through her coming out story and the vital role New York City's lesbian bars played in her own self-discovery and empowerment. You can watch Alina and Erica's film at www.lesbianbarproject.com. And we urge you to also consider making a donation through their website to help save our bars. The fundraiser runs only until the end of June, so please support this effort without delay. And show lots of love to your local lesbian bar, too. Hope to see you there. Happy Pride Month, everybody. And now, let's hear from filmmaker Alina Street. My name is Alina Street. I grew up in France and in America. Um, my father's first wife was American. And so I would come to America um, basically every year. And I have brothers here as well. So I learned how to speak both languages at a very young age. And so I was traveling back and forth um, all the time. And my father uh, was a musician and my mother was a translator. So I would often sort of follow them um, as my dad would be playing concerts and my mom would be doing her interpreting jobs. Um, and yeah, so I, I really did just live in both countries. I consider myself a third culture kid. So that's like you invent your own culture because you don't necessarily feel like you're from one place or the other. You kind of uh, create your own uh, mm -hmm. culture out of two cultures or more, mm -hmm. actually. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Um, so when did you kind of come to terms with your sexuality and how did that kind of manifest as a person navigating all these different cultures and yeah. what your coming out story is or what was kind of the most um, <laughs> memorable coming out story and, and to whom? Yeah. So um, growing up in France, a lot of people tend to think that France is extremely um, open and um, fluid and it is to some extent um, so I actually was very closeted when I lived in France. I never really had an opportunity to come out. Um, there was a lot of judgment and pressure um, and social pressure. And uh, my mom is actually quite um, religious. Uh, so in my head, I had like a patriarchal sort of idea of, oh, I, I'm going to have to fall in love with a man. I also was a, a romantic at heart. So in my head, it was like, oh, I'm going to have a happily ever after life. And because I was really into film, since I'm a filmmaker, in my head, there was always this like heightened reality where I would meet the one and only and 
if it didn't work out, it's because the one and only was there. So I would always like look for the mm -hmm. fairy tale story. Um, and it just didn't really work out with, with the men, but I kept thinking, oh, it's, you know, it's just because it's not the one, he's not the one. Um, and then I moved to London and I was like studying film. Um, I was going, I mean, we were going out a lot cause it's the UK and it's also just <laughs> university. So, um, lots of interacting lots with of many different people. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. You just have to learn how to dry, drink a, a pint on your first night out um, because it's just how it is there. Um, it's funny because in France, it's like, oh, you actually have to learn how to drink and how to compose yourself when you're drinking. But in the UK, it's like, oh, they praise you when you drink. They're like, congrats. You like drank a pint and you got really sick, yeah. mate. That's awesome. Yay. <laughs> I was like, this is very different yeah. to how I was brought up, but yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, I, um, so I guess my coming out stories, it's like a big, there's a lot of different coming out stories. I mm. met someone in London. Um, I wasn't in love with her, but I was fascinated by her. And so that kind of started, um, and I don't like, yeah, I was fascinated by her. I also had hurt through the grapevine that, she was a lesbian, so I was very intrigued, and I really was very, and I was very envious, I think, as well. Mm -hmm. So she started, she became my best friend, <laughs> and I would sort of just, like, watch Times her. Times have not and, changed. And just, <laughs> I know, exactly. I was just, like, feeling the doors of the closet and wasn't able to open them, but I was just observing mm -hmm. um, meticulously. How old were you? And then... I was uh, I was actually 18. Um, this was yeah. This was when I moved to London. So for my bachelor's degree, uh, and I I really I couldn't do it. I was too scared. So I would watch her. Um, I would watch her get into these very complicated relationships, and I would hear her out every time she had really toxic relationships and breakups. So I would start like making notes of like, oh wow, you know. It's so fascinating that women are able to really be like sensitive and talk about all their emotions. And it sounds it seems like such a shit show, but I'm so intrigued. And then I would watch the L word, of course, and I would get really turned on when I watched the L word. Oh, so, <laughs> so great. This is so okay. great. This yeah, so this whole great. time, yeah. super closeted. Um, <laughs> and then I moved to the U.S., um, I moved to New York and I was very lucky to move here because I had heard of Cubbyhole. Mm -hmm. um, and so I am one of the co-directors and creators of the Lesbian Bar Project. And I always like to say, so my co-director, Erica Rose, who um, is actually shooting a film at this very moment, um, she likes to say that Cubbyhole knew um, she was gay before she knew. <laughs> and I like to say I walked out of the closet into Cubby Hole. Wow. So. <laughs> Wonderful. Oh, beautiful. That's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, beautiful. I mean, I just I I'd never been to a bar on my own. And I think I was really ready. Um, I felt like a grown up when I moved to New York. I was like, I'm going to do this. And I was also further away from my parents so I felt mm -hmm. like I had more of that freedom and less judgment and I could really be myself fully. And so New York became my bubble and I felt very protected here. And as soon as I so walked into Cubby Hole, for me, it was like a community center, an educational space. There was so much intergenerational dialogue. I felt like I walked into mm -hmm. a classroom, you know, that I it was intimidating. There was a lot of like watching, intense, intense watching um, and I was intimidated, but I also felt safe in that, like, oh, I'm, I'm in a space where I, I feel, um, like everyone kind of feels the same way I do. And even though everyone's so different, mm -hmm. we all have that in common. So let's do this. You know, that's wonderful. Was that the first queer bar you ever went to? It was. And yeah. And were you out to yourself when you walked into cubby hole or not quite sure yet so and how did you find out about cubby hole oh so uh yes yeah, so i wasn't quite sure because as i had been very closeted still i was like oh well i guess i'm bi 
Um, and I remember telling a few people at the bar at Cubby Hole that I was bi and that I identify as bisexual. And I got so many dirty looks. A lot of like the older lesbians were like, <laughs> wow, that still happens. Wow. <laughs> it totally still happens. And a lot of the older lesbians were like, oh, like, sorry, I don't I don't do that. Like, nope. Lots of biphobia happened there. <laughs> um, so. It was intriguing, but I, I had been used to traveling a lot as a child, so I was like, this is part of the process. And I actually met, mm. yeah, the first night I was at Cubby Hole, I met Stacy Lenz, who's one of the co-owners of Stonewall, and she became my chosen family. Mm -hmm. She really, um, she is one of my good friends still, and oh. uh, she really, you know, taught me about the community. Um, and so I quickly... Um, had a few adventures um, at Cubby Hole with some very uh, amazing people, I guess. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I just think everything is an ex is an experience, and there's always some uh, you always get something good out of something. So, an experience is always a positive thing. So, I was curious just how you found out about the space because um, yeah. These days, maybe it's a little easier to find out where queer spaces are, but I'm just curious. Totally. Um, I used uh, Google. I mean, I, I, it was very, I just, <laughs> I was desperate to go into a lesbian bar. I think my, my mm -hmm. inner voice was just screaming in the closet and was like, come, please, please. So I actually just typed lesbian bars and I found Cubbyhole. I found Henrietta Hudson. I actually didn't find gingers. Um mm -hmm. And then I also found the the woods, the Wednesday night for women at the oh, woods. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, wow. But it's, yeah. And since, um, you know, this kind of like really amazing nurturing space for you, uh, as far as you coming to terms with who you are, like, um, how has that kind of developed in your growth and in, in terms of your identity? And then, like, have you come out to your parents? Like, is there another layer to the coming out process? Uh, yeah, totally. I mean, I think I fully came out when I really fell in love with my my first girlfriend. Um, so mm -hmm. there's like the the physical part of it. I didn't meet um, someone I fell in love with at Cubbyhole. Just the physicality and just feeling more comfortable with my just more in touch with myself and my body. Mm -hmm. That Cubbyhole was very helpful for that. <laughs> yeah. um, and, I mean, I'm. <laughs> Also, I, I think there's the, the idea yeah. of a group kind of um, like affirmation, like knowing that there is a place in the world. Like it's it's so different to know it in media. Like I feel like, it, you know, especially now there's so many more kind of role models and spaces, yeah. uh, you know, in online and in, in media where you can kind of see the community. But to kind of be able to touch it and feel it and see it in action mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. make friends like really is, uh, you know, and like real friends <laughs> in real space. Right. It's, uh, it you know, in, in connection to your own body as well, you know, speaking and in honoring in this time where we are so kind of disconnected because of these online kind of identities, you know. I'm sorry, and Wanda, honoring you the, mm -hmm. yeah, Just honoring the physicality. I mean, you, you bring mm -hmm. me back to my early days, too, of just like, um, just being able to uh, actually initiate that feeling that you've had and mm -hmm. you haven't been able to explore. Right. And then, you know, having that relate to your own sense of self and comfort level in your own body, mm -hmm. therefore also your own sexual identity is just, you know, transformative. Right. And the spaces, you know, are what make those things happen. Mm hmm and to be an active participant in it, like to be able mm -hmm. to enact and not just kind of be passive and like kind of waiting for things to happen. You can be in a space and like, you know, you could do either. You can choose to act or choose to, you know, Engage, just sit yeah. back and watch and, you know. Yeah, that's a really good point. In fact, I mean, I guess I back then, even even seven and a half years ago, I feel like I wasn't into the online dating at all as much. And really walking into a space gave me all the opportunities that you're talking about right now because if I had swiped right on an app and I had met with someone, I would have met only with that one person. And we may not mm -hmm. have been, we would may not have gone to Cubby Hole, right. for instance. Uh, we would have probably gone to like a straight bar or another place. Um, and as you're saying as well, it's like that spontaneous encounter mm -hmm. that you have when you're observing I was very envious when I saw these um, all, everyone from the community interacting 
and also just very comfortable in their bodies and their mm. sexuality. That was to me, Beautiful. that was really what opened my mind and made me feel like, oh, I, you know, this is giving me hope for who I can mm. become. I'm, I'm absolutely loving this conversation because this is mm -hmm. literally at the heart of what our film is about in that, like what it felt like to walk into Cafe Tabac and to see Mm. see you know and and i think it's interesting because you can come to terms with your own sexuality but there's something about a culture like to connect to a culture and yeah. to see people in their bodies if they're you know and also i'm a film person so that idea of like you know looking across the smoky room and seeing you know eyes looking at you and you oh, looking back and, you know the cinematic yeah. Yeah, and, and being with totally. people that are I mean, in your tribe, you know, just folks that, you know, like you said earlier, people that are, the moment you walk in, you know, you have something in common already. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's mm -hmm. a common ground and then you evolve from there, you know, and that's super comforting mm -hmm. in itself. And empowering. Definitely. And, mm -hmm. and absolutely. And, and memories are really created in spaces. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I think that during COVID we, realized a lot of things that we used to take for granted and we kind of got a slap in the face and we're like oh well there's ways to communicate through zoom which is wonderful and a great strength however when i think mm -hmm. of these moments that we're talking about right now i'm talking right. about i remember the cubby hole i remember that mm -hmm. night where maybe there wasn't a spotlight on this gorgeous um woman at the bar but i feel like right. there was and there was maybe even like smoke in right. the background yeah like you were saying karen yeah. well we <laughs> no literally had smoke room. we literally had smoke in the room in our time <laughs> i grew up in france so i can connect to that exactly. for sure it, it's really helpful right. for the cinematic right. aspect but it's interesting <laughs> especially pays. in cubbyhole like you know i think about like um what spaces embody you know like environments and yes like especially cubby hole with that ceiling and the light and like sometimes when it's so crowded in there it's like a little claustrophobic you're like oh my god these things are going to catch on fire <laughs> like no. it, it just feels but the colors totally. you know and then also the the excitement of like the the magic of each night like who's going to walk in the door who's going to show up that's the, the element of mm -hmm. surprise that you can't do when you're like you know can control your kind yeah. of online um platform and who's in that space and um like the right. the the unknowns and the kind of like what's everyone going to bring to the table what the you know what the chemistry experiment is going to be like what the interactions are going to be at what point of the night how many drinks like you know how crowded is yeah. it how empty will it be that night and then you know who's the bartender who's that kind of like person that's always there that you can like hey you know that knows who you are and it's just there's um definitely i think we're feeling this even before the pandemic and now with the pandemic i feel like everyone is kind of caught up to what we mm -hmm. were talking about in our film <laughs> in that like um online spaces are incredibly valuable and they've been really imp an important tool yeah. in many ways especially for a queer community and people connecting in places where they can't connect and in terms of activism Absolutely. but there's really something to be said for real space i mean um the summer you know all the the marches and gatherings that we had in protest like how do you mm -hmm. compare that with like an online petition it, you can't that energy was you know yeah people just had to go do it in person and, yep yeah hubby hole's always been this this friendly really comfortable space mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. com compared to some of the other places i mean the bars are all different they're all unique but there was always something really like family oriented yeah. at cubby hole very like, easy it, it, super special so yeah. easy even if you were walking in there on your own there was always someone that would it's small enough but someone would say mm -hmm. hi smile at you the jukebox would be pumping yeah. the bartender <laughs> would be sweet it's so like loaded with stuff that that's like you know like a comforter around you mm -hmm. <laughs> absolutely you know? like I, you're grateful that it's so yeah. small because you don't really have anywhere to escape to and you you're just have to in talk there to someone in that, right and it's still so how has did, that New York right. feeling because like you could, you know, if, if you're like just hot in there, you need a breather, you step out, that corner is so beautiful. The cobblestones and like just being on that corner with oh, the street, it, like, like Wanda, I remember your space, um, Bardo, like even that corner, it just had that magical feeling of like that fuzzy New York mm -hmm. street lamp. And you're just outside and like the shadows and the murmurs and like that electric feeling of party, you know, mm -hmm. um, it just feels so New York, that corner. Totally. 
So let's launch into your um, your like coming out to your family, especially you're saying your mother's or your stepmother's uh, super religious. That's, yeah, my um, mother. Interesting common <laughs> thread line well, for a lot of difficult coming out stories. Totally. Uh, well, so my mother is actually um, she was just very mm. uh, Catholic. So here's the thing: my um, my father actually uh, passed away two years ago, and he had um, a sorry. neurodegenerative disease for the past. 10 years. So when I Oof, started going tough. through the whole coming out or closeted phase of my life, I actually, I think mm -hmm. one of the reasons I didn't fully come out is because I thought, you know, I'm just under this traumatic, um, just aftermath of what's happening to my father. And I adored my father. Mm -hmm. I adore my father. And so mm -hmm. I, that was also probably why I didn't come out till I was 26 because I, so I'm now 29 I'm turning 30 in September um I was like I'm just I you know I'm, I'm not quite myself so and also the fact that my father figure is not present anymore maybe I'm doing some kind of transfer and that's why I'm obsessing about women mm -hmm. <laughs> and we we like to overthink yeah. so that's what was really happening um and so when I told my mom she had been caring for my father for a few years and so she actually changed a lot she used to be a lot more strict when I was younger and when I told her she was she wasn't uh she was accepting of it but she was quite surprised and she said is it because of your dad's illness mm -hmm. <laughs> and I said nice. well I I don't know I think it's just um I don't think there's a reason she said when did you start when did this happen? You know, what happened? What's the event right. What's that the cause? triggered? What's the cause? <laughs> and I, and at the time I was still pretty, I think new when I was sort of just having my sexual awakening, really. It's interesting because I also would sleep with men and I never, I never had an orgasm. And that's also when I knew that I was a lesbian is when I had my first mm. orgasm. <laughs> That'll do it. Um, so it's like sexual liberation, freedom. Um, and I, it was pretty late as well. And so I told her that actually. I had never, because my mom was very private in terms of that. Like we never talked about sex. Mm. And so when I told her, hey, you know, I, I also had my first orgasm with a woman. I'm, I'm blushing. <sighs> um, <laughs> She was really stunned because not only am I telling her I'm coming out, but I'm telling her that I'm a sexual human. So not only was I, um, right. oh, a, wow. yeah. all of a sudden I was like a sexual being to her. If I had just introduced her to like my boyfriend, it would have been, oh, you know, um, she's dating someone. But it was different this time because I actually said to her, I had my first orgasm with a woman and we had never really talked about sex before. And so she was like, she was stunned. But because, as I was describing, uh, she had become a little bit more um, less rigid because of my dad being sick for so right, long. Right. She actually so accepted it, but she did say, um, she did say, well, that's great, but just make sure you don't show it too much. Mm. So it's basically like, okay, but stay in the closet. <laughs> and... Yeah, and in the moment I I wasn't actually I was I was still pretty shy about it. So I I said, "Okay, I I, I know what you're saying." And I said, "What what are you, you know, are you, you're just saying this to protect me?" Mm -hmm. And she had been asking me the causes of like, "Oh, you know, is it because your dad is sick and is it because you're doing a transfer?" And um Yeah, so it was received in that way right away. I think it was the shock that was speaking when I told her. Mm -hmm. And then I have four brothers. So it was actually the hardest was to come out to them because I grew up with this army mm -hmm. of brothers. They're like these amazing men. And I'm also the only woman in the like I was the only sister. And I was always the one kind of in charge of the brothers. Like even my older brothers, I kind of became the the connector with everyone because I'm always mm -hmm. the most communicative. And I just want to make sure everyone's like up to speed with everything, especially because our family's so scattered between mm -hmm. Europe and America. And so when I told them, two of them were like, oh, it's a phase. Oh, yeah, I had an ex-girlfriend who did that to me. Remember, like, <laughs> remember Julia? She totally broke up with me for, like, she just had this, like, adventure with a woman. So, <laughs> but I felt like I was betraying them because they knew me as, as I was, it's like this, like, 
I, I loved this romance. I had this romantic insight about finding the one. So they were like, I was, I felt like I was betraying them. I was basically saying, you know, your masculinity or everything that you've been showing me, I'm not going for, I'm going for, um, I'm going to be a lesbian now. <laughs> <laughs> and how so, are they today? Um, so now they're, they're, they've understood. I mean, it's funny because <laughs> the lesbian bar project, uh, started off as a PSA last year and is now a documentary film. And we raised over $117,000 for the lesbian bars Amazing. And it's just been like mm-hmm. an incredible adventure. And, you know, we highlighted all the lesbian bars in the country and we've been connecting and more than ever. And I've now said on so many interviews that I'm that I like that I'm gay and I'm a lesbian. <laughs> and it's it's interesting because that's just yeah, I like really came out um, through social media as well, which I hadn't done before. So there's like many, I feel like nowadays there's so many ways Mm. you're coming out all the time. Like I come out in my workspace, I come out with my friends, I come out with, um, my family. I mean, um, it's, it's hard because I also, um, I look femme and a lot of people. So the whole face thing also comes from some of my coworkers are like, Oh, like you don't look like you're a lesbian, Mm -hmm. you know, like the, Wow, we're, Stereotype. we're still there, we're huh? Still doing that, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, and and now mm-hmm. there are so many. It's it's amazing because the community is also really opening up. So finally, you know, we're talking about non-binary and we're talking about um, mm-hmm. uh, queer, and it's it's incredible because it's also giving a space to people who didn't necessarily identify as lesbian to identify as something that they really identify with, and that's talking about spaces it's mm-hmm. really great to see these like the the progressive spaces changing to cater to the marginalized communities um and i think it gets confusing though it does get confusing for people who are not from the community so those coming out stories still happen a lot because it does get confusing and i think we just need to make sure we keep educating as well as um as as well as really like evolving right it's nice Go to ahead. have to to hear you use the word lesbian because uh, there's been many queer people that I've younger generation um, LGBTQI folks that I've talked to that have a reticence to use the word lesbian because they feel it's either um, old fashioned, antiquated, it doesn't apply anymore. Uh, can can would you talk a little bit about your usage of the word lesbian? And how you how you feel uh, comfortable identifying as a lesbian as opposed to um, another? Yeah, totally. Um, so it's uh, it's it's hard to put a label, and I think it, the community can be intimidating because it has so many labels, and people also can judge you if you don't identify as something or not, and so. I think when I came out, queer wasn't as popular. And I also, I think, you know, a lesbian can mean many different things. And perhaps I'm not from that younger generation and I'm still just like on the cusp. Uh, But to me, um, you know, I I do understand that women who love women are not necessarily lesbians and they can identify as whatever they want. And in fact, in the Lesbian Bar Project, it was a a a decision we made to call it the lesbian bar project because we wanted to honor the term and we need to also respect and embrace the past and Mm -hmm. uh, remember it. And also because that's what's paved the roads to where we are today. So in terms of my identification with the term lesbian, because I'm in a way I have the old schoolness of being European um, because, you know, they don't even in France, we don't even use pronouns yet. Um, and the terminologies are very different. Uh, we don't have really the word queer either. So for me, it was, you know, the, the thing I wanted to identify with the most because I was a woman, a woman who loved women. And I thought, OK, this is what I am. I'm, I'm a lesbian. So that's why I identify with the term lesbian. Um, and. I don't I, I I'm sorry I don't know if this is like a complete enough answer but I think um oh that's great 
again, it's an educational thing. Maybe if someone explained to me, like if someone really told me like, you know, you should identify as queer because this and this and that, maybe I would be open to it. Um, but that's really how I saw myself when I came out. Mm -hmm. right. um, one of the things that, that I find striking about your story is that, um, you know, like oh, it just feels like a lot hasn't changed, even though on the outside, it feels like so there's so many advances, right, in terms of uh, our cultural and kind of um, worldwide acceptance of gays. Actually, not worldwide, very specific. Um, but for the most part, there's a lot of acceptance. The culture is really pushed forward. But still, there's a stigma. And and we could be as easy about our gayness with our people. But when it comes to family or, you know, former communities or, um, you know, it, it can be uh, you know, there's still that stigma and still that kind of like, oh, I don't want to kind of inconvenience someone else, or I know that it's going to be hard for them, or even that idea of like pathologizing gay, right? It's got to come from some trauma. It's got to come from like, you know, uh, yeah, whatever. Being sick. Yeah. Right. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I really connected with your story about, um, you know, this idea of, of like, we are trying to protect our family like so for example um mm -hmm. you know your mother it's the idea that like it's not like our close family can be okay with our coming out but it's harder for them to kind of like face their public their social circle so it's in essence they're coming out as well and it's harder for them because they don't have that community they don't have the kind of like um safety that we might when we come out mm -hmm. and so it's interesting how then we kind of also internalize that somehow like, oh, I know this is going to be hard for you and maybe shameful for you or whatever it is. Like maybe you've um, they see it as a kind of um, they haven't been a good parent. And that's why this has happened again, back to the pathologizing of it, you know. And so it's interesting to see how as far as we've come, that there is still this kind mm -hmm. of like sticking point that makes it challenging for us to kind of come out yeah, in this way. We don't want to hurt the people that I guess we love. And you mentioned your mom, you mentioned earlier, your mom was very religious. How mm -hmm. can you speak to how maybe her religion may have played a part in her acknowledgement of your coming out? Um, we never really talked about sex because it was very, it was almost very, it was very shameful. So I was raised with a lot of shame when it came to my emotions. It was shameful. I was really into theater and I was really into writing. And I think she would always tell me I was a drama kid because I think it was pretty shocking for her to see, I guess, a younger version of herself because that's how I guess you see like a, a younger version of yourself when you see your child who is, is really like taking full advantage of um, their their gender expression or their um, identity. And I think that was pretty um, triggering to her. And so I just saw her being ashamed a lot. And I, I was very against that because I didn't understand it that way and I didn't see the world that way. And I really wanted to become a filmmaker and try to change things. Um, and so, yeah, I, I guess... It wasn't like she was very religious. Like, yes, we would she would go to church on Sundays. We would sometimes go to church with her. And then I was lucky because my dad being a musician, um, he would <laughs> he um, he wasn't he didn't believe in the church because his mother had donated everything to the church and was my grandmother disappeared was MIA. And we found her in a trailer in the south of France. Um, so. My father was like, see, like he would tell my mom, see what the church did to her. They took everything. And oh, so wow. I was lucky because I could side with my dad <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in that. Um, yeah. And then when my dad got sick, you know, his his mind started changing and he was basically like not present. He wasn't there anymore. And I had to start a new dialogue with my mom. But I saw my mom taking care of my dad. So all of a sudden I was in a position where I was at the same level as her which is a little unhealthy when you're still supposed to be someone's child because you end up parenting your own parent. Um, but we were able to have, I guess, more. We were closer. Um, and that's why I think when I did come out, it was good that I actually came out a little later 
because I think she had been thinking a lot and she had seen me uh, become more comfortable, I think, in my femininity and in my um, identity. Beautiful. Beautiful. So um, I, I want to shift over to the Lesbian Bar Project. Um, we, you know, I mean, the uh, story is very, uh, you know, it's really amazing to hear the role that a lesbian bar had in your life, like very specifically. And I think mm -hmm. that um, resonates definitely for, for mm -hmm. me and for us. Um, but as far as creating this film project and kind of um, paying homage and then really committing to those spaces in terms of highlighting them and fundraising for them and then telling the story of um, how important these spaces were in the history of, you know, uh, in LGBTQ history. Um, tell us the mm -hmm. the impetus and the inspiration and and how this kind of like, you know, started. Yeah. Launched. Yeah. yeah. So um, March uh, 2020, uh, when COVID hit, our industry as filmmakers shut down. And I was reminiscing about Cubbyhole and meeting in person with my friends. And I was talking to my dear friend, Erica Rose, uh, my co-director, um, about the last time we'd seen each other at Ginger's. And it was a great night. And we really missed hanging out there. Um, wow, well, I haven't been so, to Ginger's in a long time. That's kudos to you guys. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, it's, yeah. And, uh, Ginger's is not currently open, but yeah. hopefully they, Sheila will reopen. In, Actually, we in tried the fall. to go during COVID, you know, just like desperate for yeah. spaces, and it wasn't open in all this time. It was kind of sad. We we didn't know what was going on. Like, are they closing? But it, are they just kind of hitting the pause well, button? I'm happy to hear they're going to reopen. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, it's, yeah, it, it's it's. It's not a, we don't know yet 100 percent, mm -hmm. but hopefully I mean, they're a part of our campaign uh, that we're relaunching and reopening in June. So mm -hmm. definitely. Um, but so there were a lot of articles, actually, that were NBC out published an article about the fact that there were only 15 remaining lesbian bars right. in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, there was an article. on the Yeah. Yep. yep. Mm -hmm. Vice did a really good piece. Um, uh, the New York Times also did a piece about actually representation of lesbian bars in Hollywood, um, which is another story for another podcast, but like, it's true growing up, just watching the L word, it was a very distorted, like it's very different to cubby hole. The planet is very different vibe. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I wish I had been a part of the lesbian chic movement and <laughs> cafe tabac, but unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> um, so we're both filmmakers and we, you know, decided that, this was the time to do something to give back to the community. And this was a time for us to become activists as well. It's a form of activism, but we couldn't film in person and the bars were closed. So we did some research and like found a bunch of archival and wrote a PSA. Um, it was an ode to lesbian bars. Um, and Leah Delaria became our executive producer and our narrator uh, so she narrates the piece beautifully and walks us through these spaces in time. And we have an, a, a moment where we also talk about spaces that have closed. And then afterwards, it ends in a call to action. And we needed some uh, production costs as well to be to help us really elevate the project. So Jägermeister, out of all right. brands, um, actually... <laughs> tagged along for the ride and uh they had launched this incredible campaign called the save the night campaign that was aiming to mm -hmm. save uh night spaces from disappearing due to covid mm -hmm. and so that was really our mission was very aligned with theirs and they have been so supportive and kind and collaborative and they've really mm -hmm. given us a lot of space to do exactly what we wanted to do and to represent them the way like we really found a great way to communicate and work together and so we did a 28-day campaign last fall, and we raised over $117,000 uh, for the bars. It got evenly distributed to the bars. Um, it We managed to pay some, some rent, um, some of their staff, and we highlighted them on this virtual map. And it was great because it was like the first time that they were all in one place at the same time. We organized um, two virtual events. One of them was with like a roundtable panel discussion. Um, also, Leah Delaria was talking on that 
Roxy, uh, Roxanne Gay was there, Rosie O'Donnell. Um, wow. it was, it was really nice. And they were also talking about how important lesbian bars were to them. Um, mm-hmm. and then we did a comedy show as well, virtually to raise for the campaign. So it became, a uh, more or less a full-time job at this point. <laughs> yeah. um, mm-hmm. We, Our industry has now reopened, so uh, we are able to pay our rent by going back to work, but we are <laughs> working full-time on Lesbian Bar Project when we can, and uh, Jägermeister greenlit a longer-form documentary film, so 25 minutes. Um, Amazing. Mm-hmm. We're, we're going more in-depth. We're talking about bar owners. Uh, we're talking about community activists, patrons, um, archivists, and researchers. And we went to Cubbyhole, Henrietta's. Then we went to D.C. because we have uh, been following this incredible couple, uh, Joe McDaniel and uh, Rachel Pike, who uh, used to work at A League of Her Own. Joe McDaniel was the general manager at A League of Her Own, which is the lesbian bar in D.C. Uh But they both recently left the bar to uh, actually create their own bar. It will be called As um, As You Are Bar. And we followed them as they were scouting these incredible spaces Mm. to create their lesbian bar. And it really, for us, in terms of our storytelling with Erica, it was like we wanted to show the hopeful future Mm. post-pandemic as well. Um, Beautiful. And then we went to Mobile, Alabama. Oh, I love it. (laughs) Incredible. We um, went to a bar called Hers, uh, which is an amazing um, bar that was... uh, It came to life two years ago. Um, Rachel and uh, Sheila Smallman, um, they're an incredible couple. Their story is so touching. And to them, hers is like their baby. And they've created a community center there. And we were able to interview their patrons. um, And we also interviewed um, Kim McKeend, who um, was able to legalize uh, gay marriage uh, in Alabama. What? Uh, so it's a whole Is like it really yeah, legalized it's, in Alabama. That's wonderful. That yeah. Oh, it, it passed. Shocking. It passed. That's great. Shocking. <laughs> Alabama. It's of shocking. All places. That is true. I know. Shocking. Al- that's really yeah. that's amazing. Wow. That's wonderful. That's great that you've been able to follow the not only the bar owners, but what they've also been doing with their communities and, and the activism around the bar space, you know. Absolutely. And it, it's so important to show the different landscapes as well, because these spaces mm-hmm. serve different purposes right. in different landscapes. And they're all so important for different w- reasons as well. Right. I mean, we think about like in our generation, you had to move to big city. I guess these are big cities in their right. regions. Mm-hmm. But like a lot of people come to New York is specifically like like for you, you know, find to find yeah. that kind of freedom and to be able mm-hmm. to kind of be an independent human being outside of whatever tethers you have in, in your family, culture, whatnot. And um, it's kind of exciting to see um, outside of the big cities like New York, San Francisco, L.A., to see when, you know, I mean, these are big cities in their own regions, of course. But, um, you know, for us big city people, <laughs> it's still like, yeah. Yeah. wow, you know. With, yeah, with, absolutely. Um, with online dating and all of this other, you know, ways of meeting people, I guess, and, and pandemic, you know, nobody was able to go out and engage. Do you, and, and we've lost so many bars and there's so many different reasons for that, that, you know, we can get into or not. Uh, do you find that in your research and in your talking to folks, what are, what are people saying in terms of the needs for or not of queer spaces, uh, particularly also since, again, in big cities, there there's more inclusive spaces, there's uh, more acceptance. There's been conversation about whether those spaces are necessary. Of course, you know what we think, but I'm just curious what, what you've been hearing. Um, I, yes, I've been hearing that there is a huge need Um, And there's also a huge need to understand uh, the evolution um, of the community. And so one of the reasons Mm -hmm. we uh, documented Joe McDaniel and her partner, Rachel Pike, in D.C. as their opening As You Are bar is because they're really looking for full inclusivity. And, you know, they're Mm. calling it a lesbian bar and 
And we just have to, and I think that's um, really important is that these spaces are, you know, need to be catered and respectful to everyone. And we Mm -hmm. won't tolerate any um, transphobia or we won't tolerate anyone. Biphobia. Exclusions. Exclusions. Right. We're working with Henrietta Hudson, of course, again, for our new um, campaign. So I just to bridge the documentary is going to be premiered in June for Pride Month. And we're going to be reopening our pool fund. And we now have a list of 21 lesbian bars. Um, So a few revealed themselves uh, since last fall, which is very exciting. Yeah. And we we did have so now Henrietta's came out as they came out now everything is a coming out story. Um, they came out as a queer uh, bar built by lesbians. So we did have some comments of people who were saying, "Oh, you know, this isn't this isn't a lesbian bar anymore." But the thing is, we're arguing that it's people like them that make things difficult. So we also need to be very open and cognizant and accepting of the evolution and tolerate everyone. Mm-hmm. So yes, we absolutely need spaces. Oh, I think it's, <laughs> yeah, it's definitely yeah. Um, a complicated conversation because I think, you know, um, when, when it was much more this binary conversation or this binary acknowledgement and not, I mean, it was, it was very exclusionary and very like defining mm-hmm. in this kind of concrete way. Um, the, the, the challenge was to find spaces where, where women, um, I, I'm just going to mm-hmm. say cisgendered women, you know, were able to kind of, um, find and nurture, you know, our spaces because of the, like the gender differences between cisgendered men and cisgendered women, as far as like the privileges and the entitlements and um, how space itself can be kind of owned. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I just think about like, what if there is that case where you have someone coming in and it's like a cisgendered male and this idea of like exclusion. We can talk about what happened at Starlight. That was very similar situation where, so, you know, I had this, this space Starlight on Avenue A and, um, so the bar was a, a gay bar, let's say. we I don't know that we even used the word queer. It was a gay bar seven days of the week. Sundays, we wanted to really just have it be a lesbian space. Men were allowed to come in, but they needed to come with accompanied by at least three women. Because by being inclusive, the space started to get overrun <laughs> by by gay men or queer men or you know so it it just in order to be able to keep it safe for lesbian women to feel like it was still their space we had to create some parameters uh even though we wanted it to be inclusive to all so Mm -hmm. you know it it got tricky Mm. it's it's a very fine line it's it's difficult i think that now we have the language Mm -hmm. so i think there needs to be proper training at the door as well to really talk about the language and make these, you know, um, make these spaces cater to, I I understand, I understand the difficulty. Um, now that we have all this terminology and all this language, I think people are able to identify with that more than they have Mm -hmm. in the past. So it's important for that to be understood as well. Yeah, I think that expansion of the language is kind of the first gateway to the awareness and then the awareness towards actually implementing these changes where we see um, gender as beyond the binary and Mm -hmm. seeing sexuality as this very like wide spectrum of of um, identities. And, you know, like I love the idea that the bar finishes with and because it is what we don't know. I mean, I think there is a lot of like mm. exclusion that happened in prior generations because at that point we didn't know yet. The language hadn't been like the language stopped at a certain level. We couldn't even imagine anything beyond that um, in terms of like the the mainstream culture or the broader culture, queer culture. And so I think it's really interesting, the idea of language, because it is kind of like the first line of action 
it's the first line of consciousness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and consent as well. I think if people understand mm-hmm. that they're entering a space where they have to be respectful before even Absolutely. entering it, if they're being reminded that and they actually have mm-hmm. to consent to it and actually agree to it, maybe that can change the way that they will react or behave. Mm-hmm. Sorry, we haven't even talked about, you know, the economics of why it is actually also important to be able to allow more people into your space, you know, to keep it viable, you know, so there's all that too. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I was just going to say at at HERS in Mobile, it's really interesting because their um, sign looks a little bit like a a, a strip club because it's near, it's near a a busy road. Um, It's like a standalone bar. And... They we talked about it with the owners and they said, oh, you know, I we we did it on purpose because we want to welcome everyone. And, you know, our there are a lot of people here who aren't in the community who also help our business, um, but they are still greeted with a hug and they are still helping us with our business. And, you know, they they think it's a strip club and they're met with a very different vibe but they actually love this energy as well they love this warmth and they love this chosen family um feel that we provide them so it's interesting that's a way of also changing your your patrons um minds or expectations Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) they're walking into pole dancing but you're with a bunch of lesbians oh they're so nice (laughs) exactly (laughs) Well, it's, it's interesting in, in Sydney. Um, it's like there are so many um, like the people have told me about what the gay bars are, are all straight. And they're the ones who are like, oh, pride is so amazing. And, you know, it's it's really infiltrated into this kind of like broader culture so that it's it's not unusual to see <laughs> straight people at gay bars, you know, and like having right. the best time. And and pride is this hugely like cross-sectional you know it's just like another event um you know city event and so that's really also interesting to see that and i wonder you know i'm sure there are many uh pros and cons to that sometimes you know you you do kind of want your little nest of of queerness of course and i think that's when for instance the patrons that walk in that just reminded me actually um they were saying they don't necessarily want bridal showers for hetero you know <laughs> right. well it's because in a way that this yes, is using yes. mm-hmm. the culture this is right. using the community exactly. this is like tokenizing the community mm-hmm. and that's when that's when we're not respecting the basic rules of right. of c- consent and i think that's one thing that that just reminded me of is is really that's a way of filtering you know what are what are mm-hmm. you here to do <laughs> it's like are you here right. to just um how are you perceiving us basically if you're perceiving us as something different Mm -hmm. then there's something wrong to begin with Mm right right yeah totally good point Mm -hmm. wow so i I guess my my last question is um you know we've talked about the past uh the legacy of of lesbian bars and how it's uh um nurtured your coming out um what do you see as the future how would you love to see the future of a lesbian Um, bar I would love to see more (laughs) because there are little, there are very little. And I, I would want Mm -hmm. every younger generation to have a similar experience that I've had with these spaces because they do exist. So, um, I, I would just say that there, there needs to be more communication about it and more of them. Um, but people also need to show up to the bars because a lot of the times these bars are also disappearing because not enough people are showing up. It's it's one thing to mm-hmm. say, I'm devastated because they're disappearing and it's another to actually show up. So it's a form of activism too. Um, and we've seen it in the past, reflected in the past. So I would say um, the way I'm seeing it is people are more responsive to communicating and to 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 the community evolving so people also need to show up and and understand that it's not just that they they need to also be present my last question perhaps or maybe it'll oh, yeah i have another question of course this is um, nothing new <laughs> yeah. uh so i wanted to ask you how um 
how coming out changed your life or changed you as a person uh and what the importance of coming mm. out and if what 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 is the importance of coming out you know because not everybody has the privilege to be able to do mm -hmm. that um and what is what did that mean for you so coming out means or coming out meant that I came to terms with um, my identity, my self-worth. Um, it gave me confidence and it also gave me the opportunity to understand who my community was. And when you're young, you have a tendency to gravitate towards your friends at school because that's all you have. And then when you grow up, you're in this big playground that you've never encountered before. And coming out gave me the ability to approach these new friends who then became my chosen family. Beautiful. I could, I can't imagine um, mm -hmm. it being said more mm -hmm. poignantly than mm -hmm. that. That's beautiful. Thank um, you. Thanks. I, I want to go Thank quickly you. back to the last, last thing, even though that's a really great place to end on. Um, I'm just you know, like you such a wonderful. Yeah, no, answer. that's amazing. Um, you know, I think about like this idea of brick and mortar because we have online, mm -hmm. and you can kind of create events, and that kind of transiency can also help kind of foster this kind of flexibility, whether in physical space, but also in terms of like the kinds of communities you're gathering. Like, why do you think this brick and idea of brick and mortar of that space that is always uh, you know, a lesbian space. Like, you know, I think about um, a lot of the queer spaces um, of color in Brooklyn, you know, that mm -hmm. don't have brick and mortar, that exist in this kind of like fluid way. And yeah, or like the peers. It can, yeah. it can be, you know, a positive thing because then you're, it's like, it's really, it's great. You know, you, things can come up and there's a flexibility to it. Um, and who's in the room and who's DJing and who, you know, and the spaces you get to embody. Um, and I just wonder, you know, with because we all have phones and, and access to social media mm -hmm. and able to kind of like ping in a very moment to moment basis, like why why is there still like value in the idea of brick and mortar? Yeah, I mean, it's it's so easy to hide behind your phone um, and it's it's easier to talk to someone through FaceTime Um but there's nothing like an in-person encounter. And I really think that you create memories in a space. You know, a space is not just four walls. It's um, an energy. It's a time of day. It's a time of your life. Specifically, you came from a place. You're going somewhere after. And you cannot have that. I don't believe you can have that on your phone or uh, online. So for me, I think it's, it's so important and crucial. And it's also really fun because we discussed it with Cubbyhole. You know, Cubbyhole has that whole, the space really defines your interaction with the people. You're in this very tight space. It's really hot. People are walking in and you see them right away because they're in front of you or they're like, you know, uh, just like rubbing themselves against you. Um, so you, you have to see them. Um, exactly. And that's also really helpful to feel good with your body as well and like understand, you know, how you navigate space. And mm -hmm. we are social beings. We're meant to be in social spaces. We're not meant to be alone in a room or we're not meant to, we're, we're meant to meet these spaces people in these spaces that are made for that specifically. So they're so important. And now that there's outdoor dining, it's interesting too, because people are meeting up outside and they're actually enjoying nature again. Like you're in New York city, but you hear the birds chirping. I mean, you do hear cars and there might be a dump truck like right next to you and you might smell some trash, but and someone's screaming. And yeah. <laughs> but we're New Yorkers. We love that, you know, yeah, exactly. why we're, that's why we're here. Yeah. Yeah. But I love this idea of time, you know, that you mentioned the, the memory and time in these physical spaces because digital time is quite different. And so 
sort of like the passage of time, mm -hmm. as 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 you said, like getting off the subway, getting to, into the space, being in that space. All of these like moments cannot you can't you can't do that digitally. You can't do that on the phone. It's just very different. It's not yeah. the same. No, there it's seems to be like a through line with time in the way it exists offline. Whereas mm -hmm. online, I feel like it's constantly interrupted. Something else, and like. I feel like mm -hmm. my memory since smartphones has like nil, like I can't remember anything because, and I really think it's because of the interruption of time of constantly like checking into this alternate totally. space on the phone. That's like neither here nor there. Yeah. And that's actually, that's why I wanted to come here yeah. to record because I was like, I'm making this an experience really? for myself, yeah. and just, you know, and the tactile I'm, and the smells yeah. and the things. I mean, I, I like, I wish I could smell you guys right now. Like, what do you smell like? <laughs> like, you know, what, what do you feel like? How, how's your body moving? I mean, these things are just completely uh, unavailable yeah. on Zoom or face, you know. But yeah, I love the, I love this conversation. This yeah. is really great. It's totally yeah. thank like, you for like Karen said up our alley. You know, we, Karen and I also started thank our you. documentary film having mm -hmm. a very similar conversation mm -hmm. at a, at a restaurant at the bar <laughs> counter. Numerous, numerous talking it, about it. Like, got to a point where it's like we're always at a bar. <laughs> We got to make something out of this time. <laughs> I know. The, uh, the import the importance of space, you right? Know, the importance of. Yeah. Uh, queer space and yeah uh, yeah and to unpack that because we wanted to get beyond just this idea of nostalgia like to mm -hmm. understand what that real value was like yes. it's, it was so easy to say oh remember back when and it was things were so great back then but you know yeah. we also didn't it didn't settle it, like we didn't wear that kind of mantra easily either we knew that there was something more to that and like oh, that, are we right. reminiscing or is there actually yeah he said mm -hmm. yeah and and then to really kind of like get into it like roll up our sleeves and get into it and see like what was that like was it really something special or is it just nostalgia mm -hmm. and yeah of course there's nostalgia also but it was connected to so many different things and I think you know you're also seeing that as far as like seeing lesbian bars as like community spaces or spaces or um, even opportunities for activism, even in the showing up of a bar, like what those spaces actually Absolutely. meant. And then the conversations and the definitions that are constantly being redefined. And, you know, I think that is so beautiful and important. Like what other space is that active, you know, that is also social? Yeah, absolutely. And, and we're lucky now that we have the online space to also explore activism mm -hmm. and take it to another dimension. Right. Um, but we have to use it wisely. Right. Um, and I think by use by having the language, we can convert, we can project that over back to our spaces and right. also pay tribute to the past and also make sure that, you know, this happened to bring us here where we are today and we still we, we still need to honor that and not forget it. And that's I think that's why the Lesbian Bar Project um, took off is because people took the spaces for granted right, right. and realized, wait a second, you know, it's it's not just a COVID thing. It, they were at stake before. Mm, right. And yeah, they. Yeah, yeah. for various and, reasons. And of course, yeah. Of course. Yeah. So we're um, reopening our pool fund or crowdfunding campaign in June um, with the release of the documentary film. So from June 2nd till July 1st, um, we'll be opening up the Lesbian Bar Project donation pool fund and uh, we'll be crowdfunding for the 21 bars listed on our new updated list <laughs> and how can how can people access and maybe you want to like give the url mm -hmm. or kind of give a little like call to action so please donate to the lesbian bars at the lesbian bar uh the crowdfunding pool fund will be open from june 2nd till july 1st wonderful and they could find out more um about you guys up to the minute through your social media, which is Lesbian yes. Bar Project, right? Yes, correct. Great. We will be releasing our documentary film and uh, we'll also have a trailer for the film too. That's great. Thank you for listening. For more, subscribe to Sundays at Cafe Tabac, the podcast. You can learn more about us and our film at cafetobacfilm.com and at Cafe Tabac Film on social media. 
please share your thoughts with us on social media. And if you have a coming out story that you'd like to share for a possible feature here, reach out to us. Thanks for listening.